what we find out when we start looking at the origins of humankind, and the deeper you delve into this, the more you realize how really exciting this is, that the history is so much more important, so much more impressive, and so much more um, wilder than we could have imagined. And it's much older and more exciting than most of us could have imagined. And uh, I call it, uh, in Germany, I called it funky, and the Germans really seem to have appreciated that word funky. So I'll say, the history of humanity is far more funky than most of us could have imagined. And that just, you know, if we keep our minds open to the possibilities, uh, it really allows us to stretch ourselves into areas that many people uh, are not prepared to go. And that's truly what I found is the moment you think you start, that you, you believe you start, you've started to understand the history of this planet, you're making a mistake. We're looking at millions of years, we're looking at billions of years of history, not just a few thousand years like our historians and our anthropologists and our archaeologists keep shoving down our throats. We're dealing with a mysterious planet here. And one such example is this giant footprint near the border of Swaziland, near a place called Impaluzi. And this is a huge mystery and an anomaly, how such a giant footprint could have happened and emerged in granite. The fact that it's in granite itself shows us that we know nothing about geology, how geological formations actually happened, what is behind the, the geology around us, um, how it materializes, and we need to put a new thinking cap on and go back. So the interesting thing about this footprint is that it's about four feet tall, which would have been made by about a seven and a half meter giant. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because my friend Klaus Donner from Vienna found the remains of a giant that was about seven and a half meters tall in Ecuador, which has been histologically tested and scientifically tested and, and uh, concluded that it was a humanoid being that would have been about seven and a half meters tall. And so we start to look at this really wild history of this planet that many people are not prepared to go and, and absorb and embrace. And uh, that takes us to the fact that, that the moment you start looking and exploring the origins of humankind, you get to my favorite subject, and is, that is sound and resonance. You cannot escape this, no matter what books you read, what civilizations you, you, uh, you look at. Sooner or later, you will come across this phrase, sound and or resonance. And that's where everything starts to congeal and start to paint a beautiful picture of our, our understanding of what's really going on. Sound and resonance are the common links of, religious, of religions and creation, and you can't escape that. In Christianity, we have the Word, God said, let there be light, and it's important, just that sequence, said, light, sound, and light. That's a very important sequence here that we, we start finding. In Hinduism, we have the Om or the Aum. Egyptians believe that the universe was sung into creation, and this Hindu creation story is just phenomenal. And it's, this is the beautiful thing. When you start connecting these dots, you realize that the ancients are telling us the same information in different words, and it gets really exciting. And we start coming face to face with this number six, the six days of creation, that very quickly can be uh, explained with sacred geometry. And you realize that the sacred geometry subject is a huge subject that we need to embrace because it's from sacred geometry sacred geometry that we get all our wisdom and knowledge in mathematics, physics, geometry, astronomy, and so forth. All the knowledge of creation comes from this very simple study. And, um, and mathematicians and scientists that do not embrace this keep running into dead-end walls and dead-end streets before they start to realize that they need to embrace this knowledge and this information. Six days of creation on the seventh day God rested. In Hinduism we have, uh, and Buddhism we have the six aspects of Om and uh, then we have the Mayan creation story, which is equally beautiful. The heart of sky and six other deities, including the feathered serpent, wanted to create human beings with hearts and minds who could keep the days. And you realize that we're getting into a lot more sinister kind of creation story that keeps a lot more secrets than we imagine. Uh, six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. For those that understand resonance ratios will realize, oh, that's, what's, that's what this is all about. It's actually about resonance, resonant harmonic ratios and resonant frequencies, coherent resonance that starts to pull things together. And we realize, we ask ourselves, what does this all have to do with ancient civilizations? Well, 
everything because they understood this. And this is why they leave this information encoded in everything they leave behind for us. The symbols, the knowledge, the information is encoded with all this knowledge. And all we have to do is just open our minds and embrace this and absorb this information and see how it all connects. They understood sound, they understood frequency, and they used it as a source of energy. And for many people that have studied this, it becomes very obvious. I've been saying this for a long time, that the pyramids are just giant resonators, energy generating devices. And, uh, and this is just a beautiful, um, I think this is um, um, uh, Mr. Dunn's brilliant work on studying the pyramids. And this is supported by this ridiculous photograph that clearly shows us that there's some weird energy coming out of the pyramids. You know, certain filters can film things that you cannot see with your eyes. And this is just one such example. And then the studies in the, in the, uh, that have been done at Stonehenge show us some beautiful symmetrical patterns that come out of, of Stonehenge that clearly tell us that this was done on purpose. This is a, this is a, a, a structure that was done by design for very specific um, outcomes. And this tells us there's intelligence behind it, symmetrical interference patterns that do not happen accidentally in a structure like that. Um, there'd be chaos. It shows us, and this beautiful reconstruction shows us that Stonehenge is definitely something like a resonator or an energy device, just like the stone circles in South Africa. Some of you may already be aware of that. Um, but sound and frequency was used to control and manipulate humanity. And this is where it gets, starts to get really sinister. And we realize that this information is, is further encoded in ancient symbology. The pineal gland is clearly a representation uh, represented by the all-seeing eye of Horus. And it's this kind of anatomy and the control of humanity, it starts to, um, starts to rise to the sinister and what many people call um, uh, conspiracy theories, right? There's, there are no conspiracies. There's just information. It's what you do with that information that matters, right? So uh, remember that when you take control, when I speak to you, you can't see the sound frequencies, right? Can you see the sound frequencies going to your ears? No, and yet you can understand me. Does, does everybody here understand what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Let me? Let's put it this way. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. So basically, uh, if you can't see it and you can't touch it, it means it must be magic, right? Because that's what some people argue with you. If I can't see it or can't touch it, I won't believe it. You wanna, I want to see physical proof, otherwise you're just an asshole trying to lie to me. Well, you know. <laughs> so what's the difference between the sound waves leaving my, my mouth that you can't see and yet you can still hear me and understand me and the thought waves that leave, leave my brain? Same thing, it's just frequencies and waves. And the fact that we cannot understand each other through telepathy clearly shows us that that is one of the ways that you can control humanity. If you can't read somebody's mind and you don't know what they are thinking, you can lie to them. And this is why the sound thing has become very important. It becomes a tool of deception. You can lie to people by telling them things and they believe that what they hear is true if you repeat it over and over and over again. And this is the beautiful part of the deception and the enslavement of our race is severing us from ourselves, from our ability to communicate telepathically through the pineal gland and through our thoughts, then you can start controlling people. And this information is deeply encoded in ancient symbolisms. You see winged beings and other deities with cone-shaped tools taking control of humanity with these weird-looking cone-shaped tools. You see it on symbols in the Vatican and all over the world in historic um, examples. These cone-shaped tools become very important. And you start realizing that they start taking control of our pineal gland and the tree of life or DNA, which seems to be with sound frequency devices. These cone-shaped tools. And why do I say it's sound frequencies? You'll understand soon why I say this if you haven't figured it out yet. And you know what? This ancient control carries on today. Cone-shaped tools, all-seeing eye of Horus, sound frequency. Well, that's exactly how radio and television and communication has kept us enslaved and keeps us enslaved. You can see the encoded all-seeing eye of Horus there, CBS, and, and look at the cone-shaped tools in the logo of NBC, and you start realizing that this is so deeply encoded all around us, but we're just so bloody stupid and ignorant. We're like little babies waking up to the truth, looking up at the skies, going, what the hell is going on out there? Well, there's all this infinite life out there looking down upon us saying, how can they be so stupid? They're imbued with all this information in their DNA, and they're not getting what we're trying to tell them. 
And this is the exciting thing, because we're finally waking up to these key people communicating with us and telling us and giving us this information that's thousands of years being shoving down our throats. But then you've got to ask yourself, well, what is the sound thing? And most of us have no bloody idea what sound is, because we still believe that sound is a squeal on a whiteboard that we've learned at school, right? Oh, this is a sound wave, this is, this is how it works, and, the, and that could screw you up for life. Really, because that's what you go out believing. And this is what we re have to start really looking into this depth of, of, the, of this sound and resonance and how it affects everything around us. There's a beautiful example of John Stuart Reed's fantastic work with a cymoscope and, and, and photographing three-dimensional effects of what sound really is. Sound manifests form and manifests physical shape. You know when you put sand on a metal plate and you put a sound frequency through it, it gives you these infinite number of beautiful shapes. We don't have enough time for that, but many of you know this already. If not go out and put these things into YouTube. If you need to research this or verify any of this, go into YouTube, put, put the information in, and you will find lots and lots of beautiful visual examples of what I'm referring to here, especially this one here as well. So, sound is a three... dimensional effect that happens from the source and it goes in all directions and just because you can't hear it doesn't mean it's not there remember that's the other important thing we can only hear a very specific very limited frequency range sound and resonance sound levitates and if you don't know this go onto YouTube once again look at find the the video clips that shows you how sound actually levitates objects but that is not how the ancients used to do it. Do not get confused by the levitation videos that we find on YouTube and the way the ancients did it. The current levitation sound uh, technology is just basically pressure waves used with sound waves, um, the standing waves that are crossed over, and it, it captures the little objects in the standing waves. That's not the, the ancients did it. The ancients used, uh, used sound uh, in the form of um, hypersound, where sound travels beyond the speed of light. And that's news to some people. They've never heard of this. How can sound travel beyond the speed of light? Well, that's one of the best kept secrets of science and physics. Never published, to a, well, it was published, but never put it on the eight o'clock news because we can't tell people that. If we tell them that sound can move beyond the speed of light, they'll get some clever ideas and we can't do that. So let's just keep it away from the mainstream media. And, uh, and this is how we just keep getting enslaved and bamboozled and, and remain stupid. So sound boils water, it creates light. God said, let there be light, right? Uh, it creates DNA. Yes, it does. It heals. It destroys pathogens. Sound moves beyond the speed of light, as I mentioned. It's known, often referred to as hypersound by modern uh, researchers and scientists. And it creates SASER technology as opposed to laser technology. SASER stands for sound amplified by stimulated emission of radiation as opposed to light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation. Now, remember, SASER technology was only discovered in 2009. It's relatively new to our civilization, and yet the ancients seem to have been using this for thousands of years. And the most important thing is that sound is a precursor to electromagneticism, not the other way around. Sound can be seen as the breath of the Creator, and it is what I refer to as the prime resonance frequency. Everything in creation vibrates in coherent harmony. That is how it can stay together. That is how things can all function together and interact and interlock. This is the foundation for what some people refer to as the morphogenetic field out of which all information comes. It is the breath of the Creator, the resonance of the utterance of everything into existence. And this is why we were taught for, what is it, nearly 60 years now by the brilliant information in Star Trek. And in Star Trek refers to it as the prime directive. And they tell, keep telling us that you cannot breach the prime directive, which is really just referring to the prime resonance frequency. You cannot go against that because what happens? It's just like your body. It resonates in one giant coherent uh, organism. If you go against it, like a cancer cell, if your body functions properly, your body will overcome, the resonance of your body will overcome the cancer cell and expel it. So if you are a cancer in the prime directive, in everything in creation, you go against the prime resonance frequency of divine creation, you will will be expelled. You become the cancer cell. So the, the, what uh, Star Trek has really been trying to tell us when they tell you you can't breach the prime directive when you land on another planet 
is they telling us, if you do that, you begin your own demise. You will destroy yourself. It's not going to happen instantly because this is a big universe and everything in creation is far more complex than our little brains can figure out right now. But you will begin your own demise. And this has got everything to do with what's going on on this planet today. How and why things look so screwed up. Because these giant cycles that seem to have... a uh, that seem to affect each other and create an effect way into the future while it's happening today. So, just some beautiful images of my friend Robert Burman in Holland of, of sound captured in light, in water. Sound and light captured in water. A phenomenal um, work that he's doing. The Mayan numbers, 20, 20 hertz and 13 hertz captured in light. And... Uh, and, and remember, these are, these are two-dimensional images of, of a three-dimensional effect. So you can, if you look into it, you actually see the three-dimensional thing. And, and here is my name, Michael Julius Tillinger, in, in, in uttered into, into water and captured in light. And uh, then we get into the fact that sound actually inspired religious symbols. And this is very obvious when you look at John Stuart Reed's work again. And, um, and Dean Baker, the cymoscope images, the three-dimensional images, when you get a cross-section of it and you look into it, you see the cross. Can you see that cross on the right-hand side? And some of these images, when you drill deeper into them, you get a very clear indication that these guys knew exactly what they were doing. The cross in a circle being the source of sound with the beautiful curves of sacred geometry showing you that this is not square and perfect um, stuff, you know, uh, but it's, it f certainly follows the the curves of and, and lines of sacred geometry, and you realize that those ancient uh, leaders that were enslaving humanity with religion knew exactly what they were doing when they started drawing their logos and the crosses in circles. They knew what the source of all the stuff was, all the religious crosses in Christianity and the, the Knights Templar and all the different... Um, groups in, on our planet that have taken control of this planet at various times in history. And uh, even this is beautiful. They're interesting that there are six, six lines moving out, six curved lines moving out of that circle um, and the cross in a circle. And even in Africa, these carvings, the crosses and circles of Drikops Eiland in, in, uh, near Kimberley are referred to as the, the Lord of Light, Mabona, Lord of Light and Sound by people like Kreda Mutwa. And we realize that even the medicine wheel, which is just a cross in a circle, tells us that the Native Americans knew that sound heals, and you can heal with sound. And, um, and even the Sumerian, this Sumerian seal that represents sound is the precursor to what, became, what later became, became the swastika, has its origins in sound. This Aboriginal creation story is just one of my favorites. It says, time began when the supernatural beings awoke and broke through the surface of the earth. They moved about the earth, bringing into being the physical features of the landscapes. And they did this with three sacred songs. It's again, it's talking to us about cymatics, sound coming out of the surface of the planet earth, and, uh, and creating the, the features. Now, I was going to show you a video clip, but it, it's hanging here. Um, this is what we didn't get right this morning. So go on to YouTube and put in Hans Jenny's work and look at how when, Hans, when he puts mycopodium powder on a metal plate and put sound through it, you see mountains and landscapes being formed. It is exactly as the, uh, the Aboriginal story or the original story tells us, the original people of Australia, um, the story explains it to us. And, uh, and also go and uh, look at sound levitating. Peter Davy has been boiling, sound with, uh, boiling water with sound since 1940. And he took this information to his grave. Why? Because he wanted to make money out of it. The curious thing is that he never realized he actually gave the world a solution to free energy and to, to, to cut us off from the control of petroleum and oil. Because he was thinking about this little device of his as a curiosity to make cups of tea. You know, he didn't realize that we can actually boil huge amounts of water with it. Because how do we create energy today? Electricity. We boil the water, we, bo we burn the coal, to boil the water, to create the steam, to drive the turbines. So if you can use these devices to boil the water, to create the steam, to drive the turbines, you've excluded the burning of the coal and the pollution and the raping of our earth. So Peter Davies' ignorance and, and desire to make billions of rands or dollars out of selling his device to people who want to make cups of tea is just showing how ignorant we are and how we de deny the rest of humanity from solutions that we're all desperately looking for. 
Uh, this guy here, Luc Montagnier, in 2011, created DNA, spontaneously created DNA. Why? How? By exposing an empty test tube to sound frequencies that were coming from another test tube with DNA in it. And suddenly, a few hours later, bang, you got spontaneous DNA generation. This is not magic. It's just understanding of coherent resonant harmonic principles. Same thing as you put a, a laser beam through a fertilized egg of a frog and you let, and let the laser beam land in an egg of a, of, a, uh, of, a, of a lizard. What happens to the egg of the lizard? It becomes a frog. So you transfer the genetic information from one to the other using light. So you see that between the light and sound, we're dealing with some very fundamental understanding of creation. So now, when you understand that DNA is a generation or the, as a consequence of sound, think of every nucleus of every cell, the trillions of cells in your body, especially your skin, every one of those little DNA molecules and strands that are in your, in your body, on your surface, they're like antennae sticking out of your body, picking up sound frequencies because they're just manifestations of the primordial resonant frequency. And this is what we then are. So now you can start seeing that your whole body is just the consequence of the DNA becoming, coming into creation out of sound and resonance of the prime creative resonance frequency of, of creation. And you're a consequence of the DNA and the information that's encoded in that DNA. So now you can start understanding how you don't need microscopes and you don't need technology the way we look at it today in splicing DNA if you understand the principles of resonance and how you can control it that way and manipulate it that way. Sound is the ultimate source of free energy because it is the primordial source. And uh, if you can, if sound is a primordial source, then of everything in creation, that means we can do everything with sound. And uh, this is exactly what Nikola Tesla, I believe, believed or tried to tell us when he told us that the earth rings like a bell. And that's exactly, all of you will know that the earth rings like a bell. And they call, call it by many names. One of them is the Schumann frequency or the Schumann resonance and all kinds of other interesting measurements that have been made about what's going on inside our planet. And I believe it's this that Nikola Tesla tapped into when he discovered his radiant or his free energy that was stolen by the bankers and destroyed, as we all know. And that takes us much later to my favorite, my new favorite subject is the bank obviously and we start seeing how this banking and these banking families can be traced and their effect all the way through all of human history how you can trace the effects and the fingerprints of the bankers that's an interesting name for a new book fingerprints of the bankers sorry Graham yeah. <laughs> um, and now the sound of Gaia is actually an unlimited source of energy and, and that's what we got to tap into. And it, you realize that these ancients took control of humanity through these cone-shaped tools. And these cone-shaped tools are critical because that's where I started finding among the stone circles. And this guy here, Ed Leeds Cullinan, is reported to have built and levitated these giant blocks at Coral Castle in southern Florida that he built single-handedly. He moved about these giant blocks. He carved them. He sculptured them. And, he, and uh, with apparently ice cream cone shaped tools and this is why I called it the ice cream cone phenomenon for the last number of years and uh, and you know he created and carved this incredible place it's about a hectare in size that is impossible for one individual on your own to make and if you've ever worked with stone out in nature you'll know what I mean you know you're not going to do this unless you've got some serious is the advanced technology. You're not going to do this with a hammer and a chisel and a pulley. But they keep telling us, oh, that Stonehenge, you know, the ropes and pulleys, man, those guys are masters with ropes and pulleys. You have no idea what those people can do with ropes. Give me a rope, give me a pulley, let me build you a pyramid. And, uh, and this is, you know, it's insane. So uh, I've been finding these cone-shaped tools that are in my museum and, um, and uh, and I don't always pick them up. I sometimes just photograph them and leave them in situ. And then I started finding cone-shaped tools in ancient mines in England. And uh, in, in Egypt, there are cone-shaped tools that have been on display for a long time and often just referred to as ornaments. They're just ornamental stuff. They don't really have much meaning. Or, or, and then you find, really, the, 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 the main thing in, the great, uh, in Great Zimbabwe is a cone-shaped tower that faces the sky. And that's not the only one. Great Zimbabwe is filled with little smaller cone-shaped towers throughout all of the rest of the ruins around the main enclosure. And um, 
and there's just another view of it from a different side. And then I found these beautiful cone-shaped tools in, a, in the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose, California. And what is described, what is written on these in cuneiform text, as you can see, is it that commemorates the building of the Sumerian temples. And one of them specifically refers to the temple of Inanna. And it's cone-shaped tools that are referring to this, and you start seeing the common denominators with cone-shaped tools and Caesar technology, creating Caesar beams, I believe, f focusing the sound and, se and sending out the Caesar beam technology with which you can levitate things like laser beams. But Caesar technology, sound technology, has very different effects because that Caesar actually um, has a very important effect on the gravitational field around it. And that's the important thing here. Caesar technology impacts on the gravity around it. And that, I believe, is a technology that they used in ancient times. And this also leads us to the very strange notion that in our eyes, in the retina, we have, we have rods, and, rods and cones. And you start to realize, oh my goodness, that's what it is. And the retina in your eye is connected to your pineal gland as well. So you realize that maybe when Superman can give you a death stare, and you know that in martial arts and ancient history, people talk that you can get the death stare. Someone can look at you and kill you by looking at you. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but some of you might know more about it than me. But the fact that Superman can look at something and phase it out or create a, a laser effect, you know, that's not as far-fetched as we might, might have thought 10 years ago because of these cones in, our, in the retina of our eyes. And uh, this brings us to the history of Southern Africa. And our history books tell us that um, this was a sparsely populated part of the world. Nothing ever happened here, you know. Oh, we get shown all these maps, how the people migrated here from the north and the east and everywhere. And, well, nothing can be further from the truth. This is all just lies and deceptions because they can't tell us that this was a deeply, densely populated part of the world because then we're uncovering some very important information. The ancient stone ruins of southern Africa tell us a completely different story. Unfortunately, as you know by now, I refer to them as they've been, they've been called as cattle kraal of little historic value in most of our history books, and they keep calling them that. Cattle kraal and enclosures of little historic value. Well, this is the great shame of the, the academia and the academic um, fraternity in South Africa that they have not looked at this in any greater detail. Um, this is just some examples of these stone circles. Uh, what you find is they're all circular, and yet each one is completely unique. Uh, some have very simple internal structures, some have very complex internal structures. They do never stand alone. They're always part of a much larger grid, much larger network. They look like they might be standing alone, but they certainly do not when you start to investigate them. They all were at one stage connected by these weird channels and this much larger sort of spider's web effect network uh, that connects all of them into this, this large network of stone circles connected to each other. You can look around the, the obvious structure and see the, the walls and weird terraces lying buried beneath the soil and sand, and the emphasis here is on sand. We've been finding sea sand and seashells and fossilized fish inside stone circles on tops of mountains in Pumalanga. Um, and that tells us a very interesting theory as to what happened to them and when. I do not bring that into this presentation. That's not enough time, but I'm giving you a hint here. Uh, and it's all written in great detail in the Bible. And I'm sure that Robert Schoch also talks about that event in human history. Uh, and then they made beautiful flowers out of, out of stones because they look pretty, but you have to be up in the air to see these beautiful flowers. So that clearly is not the intention here. And can you see the channels that connect them all together? And you can also see a little cluster of hexagonal cells over there. That is a whole other story about what the hell those are for. And then we realize that these stone circles are not just simple circles, but they're also deeply encoded with with aligned with the movement of the sun, the solstices, the equinoxes, the, the rise of the sun, the setting sun, the north, south, east, west, the cardinal points, and also deeper encoded with sacred geometry. And, and you start seeing the phi factor emerging out of these, and, and then hexagons emerging, and equilateral triangles emerging. And you realize that, hold on, whoever built these structures did not build them for cattle, and certainly did not necessarily build them for humans either. There's another example of a star tetrahedron coming out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're all connected with these ancient, what our historians refer to as roads, roads that were built to drive the cattle on. They're just obsessed with cattle here for some reason. I don't know, it's like 
damn cows everywhere ancient roads and channels for cows roads that link all these circles and they have no exits so these once you put a cow in there it's stuck you know it's like playing Pac-Man <laughs> you can't get out of the grid until somebody eats you <laughs> Um, this is just uh, some beautiful aerial photographs that were taken by Johann Heine uh, already in the, in the mid-80s. He started taking some of these pictures. Um, and I imagine large parts of South Africa looking like this, and that's exactly what it looked like and still looks like in large parts when you start exploring it. This is just above where I live on top of the mountain, and from that vantage point, you're looking at at least 60 kilometer radius that it would have looked like this a long time ago. So we're dealing with a large ancient civilization that was doing some really weird things, and there is no doubt that Great Zimbabwe is all part of it. You can see the very rare aerial photographs of Great Zimbabwe it show us it's part of the same structure, the same kind of um, uh, structural uh, uh, development or structural design. And uh, the other important thing to note is that there are no doors and there are no entrances. And this is the big thing. You know, this is an archaeological report from 1939 by Bloemfontein University. And some spectacular pictures that show us that these are just circles all connected like a bunch of grapes and no doors and entrances and sometimes they were not just simple circles but concentric circles and I've had many you know waking up, waking up in the middle of the night imagining cows going in over these I can see them trying to get over one wall but now you got three walls and they're like the poor cows are going to real that's uh, maybe that's why they were skinny cows and, uh, <laughs> And, and then you've got to ask yourself, well, you know, this is really interesting stuff, but how many of these circles are there? You know, if they're just a handful, then, you know, you know, it's just, you know, you can throw it out the window, and maybe you're talking a bunch of BS, but when you start realizing how many of these there are, that's when everything changes. In, 19, in 1891, Theodore Bent estimated that there were about 4,000 of these, and this is from horseback people, from riding around South Africa, Botswana, and Great Zimbabwe, and he estimated 4,000 of these ruins. By 1974, Roger Summers did a beautiful calculation, a lot more detailed information, aerial photographs, and he put a lovely calculation of 20,000 of these ruins. By this time, I entered the, the, the research field and I went, wow, 20,000 ruins in Southern Africa. This is indeed the land of Indiana Jones. This is it. This is where I want to be. And, uh, and it gets far more exciting than that, because by the time I got involved in 2007, a few months after meeting Johann Heiner, who exposed me to all this stuff, I must have walked through at least a thousand of these ruins myself. And I thought, hold on, this is, if I can walk through a thousand ruins within a six-month period, there must be at least a hundred thousand of them. So I started counting. I used aerial photographs. I used Google. I used, uh, I used whatever I could. I did extrapolations. I got averages per square kilometer, per hectare, per hundred meters. How many are there? And uh, I realized that these things are scattered all over Southern Africa in clusters, sometimes larger clusters, sometimes smaller clusters, sometimes really strange anomalies. I mean, listen, this, is south of, this is really not very good resolution, but this is south of Johannesburg. And there are thousands of these just right around us in Joburg. At, at Melville Copies, there's one. And, and, but again, they don't recognize what it is. They completely um, misinterpret what's going on at Melville Copies. Um, and on one hand, they show you, and I'm not going to digress, sorry. Let's stick to this. Uh, and, and then you get to this other side of Rustenburg on the way to Botswana. This is like five by five kilometers. This is insane stuff. There were not enough people alive in, the, uh, in 1800. Apparently, this is all, all built by the Sudutswana people in 1800. When you start doing the numbers and the maths, there were not enough Sudutswana people alive to build this. Because there are stones that are in there that are five tons you know, between 400, 500 kilograms to stones of five tons. And you start doing the maths, you say, hold on, this is, you know, maybe they might have inhabited it. And yes, we find pottery and, and foundations of, of mud huts and so forth. And that's the, the big mistake our, our academics make. They find the, the, the foundations of a mud hut wall and some pottery and they go, ah, oh, this is the Sudutswana or the Bakoni culture or the Pedi culture or whatever. And they immediately go, well, this must all have been built by the Sudutswana people. No, God bless the Sudutswana people, but they didn't build it. They occupied it and they used it for their purposes. Proof of habitation does not mean proof of construction. Rule, num rule number one of archaeology. And let's never forget that. Okay, so 
Um, when I started, I, I did those counting, and by the time I finished counting, I realized that we're dealing with more than 10 million of these structures. And, uh, and that, when you realize that, you, it, it hits you. You go, hold on, this is just, okay, how come I've never read about this anywhere? How come no one's ever talk, spoken about this? Because we don't know. And we, I realize that we're facing a whole new civilization that we've never faced before. And we know nothing about them until we start reading all the stuff that I've been writing. And you know, <laughs> since 2007, not one single university has sent anyone out to Adam's calendar or any one of these stone circles to follow up on any of this research and this information that I've been sharing. Shame on them. Shame on them. And we're sitting in one such university right here, my old university. I graduated down the road here from medical school, Wits University Medical School with a Bachelor of Pharmaceutics. And shame on this university and the others that this is the attitude they've taken. Um, so what is this, all this activity about? What do ancient texts tell us? What do we learn from this? How do we use this knowledge for future, future of humanity? I was going to tell you tomorrow. And guess what? I'm so impressed with myself, I'm right on time. So... <laughs> um, so that gives me an hour to finish the rest of this presentation. And uh, this activity is all about the gold. Do not forget that we cannot separate human history from our obsession with gold. This is the recurring fact that comes back over and over and over again. All of Southern Africa's history is pretty much all about the gold. In the 11th century, famous um, Arabic scholar writes, Ahmed al-Biruni writes about the prosperous gold exports from the port of Sofala. This is in the 11th century, but it goes back a lot further than that to the Makamati people, the Hindu Dravidian people that we had 3,000 years ago. And yes, 3,000 years, I use that word, that number very specifically because I have seen the evidence from archaeologists and historians that have shown me the evidence, and they are from our universities. But as quickly as they show you the evidence, they say, you can't quote me and you can't show this to anyone because I'll lose my job. And this is what's become of our academic institutions, that we, we, we breed a, uh, a culture of fear and, and, and keeping information and obscuring and hiding knowledge and information as opposed to exploding the opportunities and knowledge. The gold exports from the port of Sofala, and obviously we meet the kingdom of Monomotapa, the golden kings of Monomotapa. What's fascinating about this time, it actually goes back even 400 years before this because from around 700 AD already, there was this this trade in beads, and um, these particular beads that they found at Mapungubwe, by the way, they, and they refer to these, this trade in beads, the beads were worth their weight in gold. Now, you see, we read the history books, and we read a statement like that, and we go, wow, well, this is an interesting curiosity, darling, look at this, these beads were worth their weight in gold, and we carry on watching the bold and the beautiful, and we don't think about the statement, right? It's statements like that that really should go deep into our subconscious and let us try and analyze why would anybody make such a bloody statement. It doesn't make any sense. If I offer you a hand of beads and a hand of gold, what are you going to take? All right, so what was going on here in that time that the beads were worth more than gold or worth their weight in gold? Something very special about these beads. And this is a great, great breakthrough that I believe we have stumbled upon. Ancient history of Southern Africa is all about the gold. Just around the little town of Leidenburg, 75,000 gold mines were counted in, in a geological study in 2010. 75,000 gold mines, people. Now extrapolate that to the rest of Southern Africa. It goes crazy. I've had two separate reports from gold miners in the 30s uh, that found weird tunnels underground about 30 meters deep with weird artifacts and tools when they were digging for gold. And they said, what is this? this? There shouldn't be any tunnels here. And yet this is what they found. And when they called the authority at that stage, Marensky, the Marensky company, they arrived and confiscated the tools and artifacts. And all they said to the people, to the miners, thank you for notifying us. We are aware of this. And they took away the tools and artifacts with them. So they clearly knew something was going on. And that, I'm giving you a hint as to Paul Kruger and his millions and the discovery of such tunnels. Put two and two together and figure out where Paul Kruger got all his gold from because that is one question we have never been asked or we have never asked or no one ever asks. 
Where did Paul Kruger get all the gold from to load a train full of gold to send down to Waterfall Boerfen, the town that I live in, by the way? And there's a reason why I live there, because I'm looking for those Kruger millions. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, that's a huge problem we have here. Because in 1902, when he loaded that train full of gold in Pretoria and sent it out to Maputo, there wasn't enough gold to fill a train with gold. Those puny little gold mines in Gauteng and, and uh, you know, Barberton and all that, they weren't producing nearly enough gold to fill the train or several coaches with gold. What's going on here? That's the important question we should be pondering. Where did Paul Kruger get all his gold from? You're looking at the... At the I'm giving you a very strong hint, and there's a lot of evidence that I could take you through right now and spend another three hours talking just about that and some of the experiences we've had myself with my friend Klaus Donner, but that's for another presentation. And this is one of the greatest discoveries in South Africa. In a sinkhole in Carltonville in around two th uh, in 1971, the father of, of Raymond Dix, our legal advisor in all our actions against the banks in South Africa, Raymond Dix's father was, a, was one of the, a part of a, a mine rescue team in Carltonville. And he called me in one day and he said, I've been trying to tell you this for a number of years now. I've never told anyone this story before because I thought they would never believe me and think I'm crazy, but I know that you won't think I'm crazy. There was a sinkhole that they went into to test their equipment. It was about 20 meters deep from what he told me. When they got to the bottom, they saw that one of the sides was caved in. They opened it up. They found a tunnel that was perfectly paved at, around the tops and at the bottom. They walked into the darkness, and several meters into the darkness, they found one of these. They got the ass out of there as quickly as they could, he told me. It filled them with fear, and they never told anyone. And I can tell you that you can trace every ancient civilization from the Incas to the Mayas to the, to the Phoenicians to the Egyptians to the Romans to the Greeks to the Hindus to the Dravidians. You can all trace them here to South Africa. And that's a very interesting connection to make. And that connection is always about the gold. What do other ancient texts tell us? Very soon or sooner or later, you are going to stumble upon the Sumerian texts. And this is where you have to start reading between the lines and starting to extract some very important information. And you stumble upon the Anunnaki or the Anuna gods, the gods of heaven and earth. And you meet Enlil, Enki, and Anu, the father of the two sons. And you start, uh, this is just a very brief introduction for those who have never heard of this before. I trust that there are none among you here. Uh, <clears throat> Well, hopefully there are many among you, so we're actually not just preaching to the converted, we're actually sharing some information with people that are going to take this away and spread this. Um, the Sumerian texts talk about this place called the Abzu and Enki, how Enki created this huge gold mining operation in the place called the Abzu, and, uh, and that's one of the references to the Abzu. There are other references to it as well, but if we clearly if we can find a place where we can find loads of gold mines and huge gold mining activities in ancient times, this must then clearly be what the Sumerian texts refer to as Enki's Abzu, and I think I've just shown you where that is. Um, this is a, a, one of the translations in the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter, to mine the gold. And um, I must come back to this. I cannot stress enough how important the effect uh, and the influence of the Anunnaki, these Anunna gods and these beings, is on this planet, not just on this planet, on our solar system, on our entire galaxy, and most likely on the entire universe as we think we know it today. The Anunnaki, as the Sumerian texts refer to them in great detail, are far more complex beings than most of us could have ever imagined. I'm beginning to believe now from the latest research I've done that we're dealing with multidimensional entities, entities that do not just exist in one dimension, that can come and go as they please, and their so-called planet Nibiru is not what we think. It's possibly uh, a device that, like a, a giant spaceship that looks like a planet or whatever you want to call it, that has the capacity to, to move through dimensions and traverse space-time and reappear and appear. And this is why there have been strange phenomena happening throughout uh, our, our history and the solar system, and there are anomalies that don't make any sense that can only be ascribed or described or explained with, with strange geophysical 
bodies being in place, and so forth. So the Anunnaki, please go away and do more research on them. You'll see that this is, they play a huge role in who we are as a species and why we're here, but a much bigger role in pretty much everything in creation as we try and contemplate it today. This is one of the translations we find because they needed help to mine the gold. And some people say, well, if they're so advanced, they had all this technology, why did they need to create people to, to mine the gold? It's because you, you can have all the technology in the world, but you still need to get it out of the ground. So, you know, so you still need help. And it's great to create this, these beings called human beings or the Lulu Amelu, the primitive worker, because if they get injured or they die, it's fine, just breed some more. You don't have to keep fixing them, just they keep breeding like flies. It's great, so let's just let them keep breeding or just keep using them. They're so bloody stupid, or just you know, feed them with BS and let's keep abusing them and using them as slaves. And when we don't use them as slaves in mines, we'll use them as slaves in factories, and it just carries on. The slavery is just fantastic. This symbol, by the way, is very, very important. As if you don't know this yet, it's not designed by a, an ad agency for the medical industry. It's one of the most important ancient symbols we have. It's deeply encoded with, with esoteric knowledge that I really believe we haven't yet wrapped our heads around. The kind of stone that the stone circles are made of, um, special kind of stone, it's a stone known as Hornfels after a German geologist, Herr Hornfeld. It's a metamorphosized quartzite. It's black on the inside, and it has this very amazing skin, reddish-brown skin that grows around it, known as patina in geological terms. This patina is recorded from all the research I've done to grow very, very slowly, several thousand years per microscopic layer. By the time you see it with your naked eye, it's already a few thousand years old. It grows very quickly, but it, uh, those crisp, the, the, the patina starts to form immediately when the stone breaks, but it, as quickly as it starts to grow, it slows down. The thicker it is, the slower it grows. So the reason I'm telling you this is by the time you get tools and artifacts like this, these stones that ring like bells, by the time you get these tools and artifacts like those cone-shaped tools or the phallus stones I've been collecting, when they're covered in several millimeters of patina, it's not possible for that stone to be a few thousand years old. We're dealing with something that is many, many thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of years old, simply based on the growth of the patina on that tool and artifact, because otherwise it would be black, the color of the rock, and not covered in patina. If you want to go back, go onto YouTube, please put in uh, stones that ring like bells, and you'll see several compilations where I'll show you how beautifully they ring. We don't have enough time here, but that was really the true major break point for me to, when I realized that we're dealing with sound, sound resonance and frequencies in the stone circles, that the stone circles have something to do with sound. And then I realized what the stones are made of. And I told you already, metamorphosized quartzite, quartzite, silica. And you realize we're dealing with silicon-based technology. What is quartz? What is silica? It's, it, it holds memory. It conducts light. It conducts sound. It stores information. Silicon-based technology is what we use in the most advanced technology we have in the world today. But if you don't want to use silicon-based technology, if you don't want to package something into a, a shiny little box to sell to somebody, you don't need to extract it out of the stone. You can use it in its original form, in its source, source form, where it is, in the rock. If you know how to use the silica in the rock, you can create some very interesting things. Now that we know we can store digital data in crystals, and how many of you saw this on CNN? No, they're not going to show you this on CNN. This is not good for business. Can't tell people you can store dig digital data in crystals. What will happen next is they're going to outlaw crystals, and you may no longer possess crystals. They're going to come around and, and, and attach all your crystals. Otherwise, you'll be an enemy of the state because you can store digital data. You can hijack an airplane with that. <laughs> I have a crystal. <laughs> so what we're really looking at, these ancient structures, you start realizing that these ancient structures, Stonehenge, the pyramids, whatever you look at, they're actually giant memory banks, like giant Stone Age Silicon Valley. All the knowledge and information surrounding the building of it, the stuff that's encoded in it, is, is captured and stored in the silica, in the rocks. And I bet you some 12-year-old kid's going to walk up to Stonehenge, plug in his iPhone, and download some interesting shit that none of us could imagine. And I, wanna, I want access to that information very soon. 
So the other important thing is why are these ancient sites, because we're dealing with silicon-based technology, why are these ancient sites are aligned with the movement of the sun and solstice and equinoxes? Because they're giant machines. They're activated by the light. They're activated by the sound. It's like a time, time clock. The sun activates it. It comes up over there. It hits a certain stone, the silica in the stone, and, the, and it, it acts. It switches it on. And it performs a certain function. And when the sun goes down there and it disappears, it causes a different effect. And the machine starts to do something else. That's what we're dealing with here. Giant machines that we use for all kinds of things that we are no, only now starting to imagine. The flagship among all these ruins in South Africa is undoubtedly Adam's calendar. And it was rediscovered again by Johann Heiner. He's done some seriously important work in South Africa here. And, um, and when I met Johann in 2007, it was pretty much he was coming to the end of his research and uh, I guess I just took over from there, and, and this is where we are. Um, I, when I met Credo Mutwa, he started to cry. You can see my book, Adam's Calendar, on the table there. When I showed him the book, he started to weep. He said he never thought he'd see that sacred place again. And he told me it was initiated there in 1937, and uh, it's known as Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun among the knowledge keepers in Africa. It is known as the place where humanity was created by the gods, and this is where it gets especially interesting, because it's not just any kind of God that created humanity there. It's a God by the name of Enki. The Sumerian Enki is the creator of humanity at Adam's calendar. And suddenly you've got a connection between Sumerian texts and ancient African knowledge, and that is not what people expect to hear. This is what Adam's calendar looks like from a helicopter shot. It's a badly destroyed site. But you can see the tree on the right is north, the tree on the left is south, the two major main calendar stones are in the middle. It is still an accurate working calendar, by the way. You can still tell every day of the year by the shadow of the setting sun on the stone closer to us, or the two central calendar stones. You can still use it as a calendar if you want. And um, uh, John Martin New told, us, uh, told me the other day when we were there, this is one of the most impressive, if not the most impressive, calendars to measure processional cycles. And that's really impressive. I've always thought that. But now that I've heard it from John, I feel really proud that we can host this and, and show this to the rest of the world. One of the best examples of an ancient calendar that is still functional today. If you look at those stones on the edge there, you can clearly see the pointed one there. And that caught my attention, and we realized later that those are aligned to the rise of Orion. We have a Horus stone there, and then, then the edge of the cliff that drops down about 100 meters and eventually goes down a kilometer into the Barberton Valley. This is the opposing view looking into the Barberton Valley. We lifted up the Horus stone and the three stones that align with the rise of Orion, and uh, you can start seeing the connections between many other ancient sites, especially Egypt and all over the world. Archaeoastronomy is really interesting here. Because when we measured the site, you can see the blob there, north, that's north and south. You can see it doesn't sit at 12 o'clock. It's slightly left of center. And when we measured it, we found it was out by 3 degrees, 17 minutes, and 42 seconds. And this is just not possible because this is, this is true north. We're measuring true north here, not magnetic north. And uh, so clearly what this points to is that Adam's calendar was built when true north is not where it is today. But we don't quite know when that was. Now, Charles Habgood suggested that, um, and by the way, it's got nothing to do, that, that misalignment's got nothing to do with a, with a processional wobble, because it doesn't matter where you are in the processional cycle, and true north stays true north, right? It moves with it. So that three and a quarter degree misalignment has got something completely different, uh, different reasons. And one of them is possible, possible such reason as this so-called crustal displacement that Charles Habgood refers to. It happens every few hundred thousand years. And there's other evidence that seems to suggest that the North-South Pole has shifted in the past. And this is not just the magnetic North-South Pole. That keeps moving all the time. When you connect Adam, uh, Adam's calendar through Great Zimbabwe, by the way, Great Zimbabwe was Enki's domain. It is totally and utterly encoded with Enki energy. Uh, again, we've got huge amounts of scientific evidence for that, which I can't go into right now. When you connect Adam's calendar, which I believe is constructed by Enki, and you'll see why now, through Enki's house or Enki's headquarters at Great Zimbabwe, it takes you to Enki's pyramid in Giza, all along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. 
and uh, the Nilotic Meridian, as it was known in ancient times, or as it's also known today, very important line, that 31 degrees east longitudinal. Then I found this translation in Sitchin's work, Zachariah Sitchin's work. Remember, he died before he saw any of this information. Uh, before, I tried to show this to him in 2010, and then um, he came out of hospital and died two months later after I made contact with him, never knowing any of this information. And then I find this translation. Forty Shar, after arriving on earth, Enki built a special place of observing in the deep Abzu on the edge of a cliff aligned with his abode in the north and the peaks. That's as if he's described Adam's calendar perfectly, never having seen it before. And those numbers there, one Shah being 3,600 years, if you follow Sitchin's uh, calculations, it suggests that Adam's calendar was built 285,000 years ago. And that's very interesting because it still is in line with the mitochondrial Eve studies that suggest how old humanity is. And so everything seems to still be intact and in line. Uh, what are all these stone circles for? By now you should have seen it already if you don't know it yet. Very, very strong resemblance to cymatic patterns. Just like this shape of the vowel A. Uh, when you put sand on a metal plate, this is what you'll get. This kind of shape. And that's pretty much what these stone circles are. Imagine the stones being, being uh, grains of sand. And uh, they're just responding to the sound frequencies of Mother Earth. Each one of them is a cymatic pattern and a representation of the sound of Mother Earth at that particular point. By, and by putting the stones along those cymatic lines, you've created an energetic plug point into the earth using that sound and amplifying that sound, creating very powerful electromagnetic fields because of the sound as it comes out of Mother Earth, using the sound to create the electromagnetic fields, just like it was done in the beginning when God said, let there be light. And we start seeing the application of this advanced knowledge and how much energy do these, do these stone circles generate? I need to draw your attention to a little magnetron that you find in a laser beam and, uh, and um, your microwave. Magnetrons create huge amounts of energy. A little magnetron can melt metal through a laser beam technology, can melt metal in a split second. And so if a tiny little magnetron can create so much energy, can you imagine how much a magnetron made out, made out of solid silica that's 20 meters in diameter or 15 meters in diameter, how much energy a magnetron like that will create. And I believe this is the earth splitter that we refer, that is referred to in some of the Sumerian translations, that Enki created an earth splitter within a, with, with which in the earth a gash to make. And uh, this, I believe, is some of the technology you may have used. Um, the problem with this giant silicon-based magnetron is that there isn't just one of them, there are thousands of them. I asked two independent scientists, one in Glastonbury and one in, uh, at the energy conference in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, how much energy would a magnetron this size create? They both told me exactly the same thing, independent of each other. I said, more energy than all the power plants on Earth today. One such magnetron. Do with that information what you want. We have so much energy being created that what we can see, can't see it very clearly there, basically this entire huge network of stone circles is just one giant energy grid, and it's still alive today because we've measured these energies. As I told you, electromagnetic sound, electromagnetic frequencies and waves and, and sound frequencies, the loudness of them, the heat signatures. We measured 33.5 gigahertz in these walls, for example at 103 decibels and 580 megahertz activity. Some of the electromagnetic fields run horizontally. Remember, this is only inside, inside these walls. The sound frequency is coming out of the walls only when you're inside. And, uh, and the electromagnetic fields operating only inside these walls. Sometimes they run horizontally, sometimes they run vertically out of the ground into the sky. And these are the interesting anomalies that you find that don't make any sense. And this is also why you lose GPS signal when you walk in there. Not only in these particular structures, but also at Adam's calendar. At Adam's calendar, it just goes crazy. The highest, um, the allocation of frequencies in the United States ends at 300 gigahertz. That's where it ends. We measured 300, beyond 375 gigahertz at Adam's calendar. So something strange is going on here. The machine couldn't measure it. And then the, the, 
the, that's the sound frequencies. Now, you can still explain the sound frequencies in the stone walls, in the circles, because it's activation and the potential of the vibrating silica in the stone. But there's, there's no wall at Adam's calendar, and yet we measure physical sound generated frequencies of 375 gigahertz plus. And then as you walk into this, the imaginary circle of Adam's calendar, uh, you once again pick up very powerful uh, electromagnetic frequency that prevents you from getting a um, satellite signal running horizontally until you go between the two calendar stones in the middle and there everything changes. There suddenly the column runs out of the ground, the electromagnetic field runs out of the ground into the sky, much more powerful than the one around it. So what have we found? We found one of these. And it's still active. Even though it's totally broken down, it is still active and alive because we're measuring these frequencies. Sitchin suggests that the Anunnaki, they were obsessed with the gold, were taking the gold and beaming it skywards with rocket ships. I don't think they needed to do that. They had all this knowledge and technology of SASER and, and laser and whatever other vortex fields that they were creating. I believe they could just beam up the gold. And I think that Adam's calendar could be one such, one such site. I believe Abu Ghraib in Egypt is possibly another one. That, that teleportation device was created. In fact, Abu Ghraib looks a lot like this photograph here. Beam up the gold, Scotty. Uh, where do you want it? And um, that takes us to one of my favorite stories, and that's the sacred stone. One of the most misunderstood advanced tools of technology ever discovered, in my opinion, right now, as I stand here. I might change my opinion an hour from now when I hear the other presentations. <laughs> but right now, <laughs> this is a mind-blowing breakthrough energy discovery. There are hundreds of thousands of these stones in southern Africa, these donut-shaped stones known as, weight, as weights for digging sticks in South African archaeological and historical circles. If you look at the, the South African archaeological magazine known as the digging stick, they have one of these around the stick and they tell us that these were made by people in the Stone Age as weights for their sticks when they went foraging looking for food. I want you to think about this, how insane that thought is. And yet, it's all throughout our history books and our archaeological books. It's an insane thought. Any scientifically minded person will tell you that's not going to happen, buddy. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> so, what are we dealing with? Just because there's so many of them. And also, by the way, hundreds of thousands of these stones, all the farmers have them. You find them all over the place, right? But that doesn't mean they're easy to, to lay your hands on. Now, this was supposed to happen in the Stone Age when there were just a few people running around here. And yet we have hundreds and thousands of these. Or even if they are dozens of thousands of these, still the numbers don't match. When I met Daniel Nunes from New York City, who builds these little copper vortex coils, he told me that by putting sound into the center, he turns gas into plasma. That's how much energy his little copper coils create. So I realized that we're dealing with something far more important than just a weight for a digging stick, that these donut-shaped stones made out of pure silica virtually are really toroid vortex generators. That's what these things are. And that's pretty much what Crater Mutwa hints at when he starts to explain to you what these are. But you know, the shaman don't always tell you straight up what they're trying to tell you. They speak in parables and they let you figure it out for yourself. And sometimes it takes you a year or two to figure out what he told you. And that's what, exactly what happened with me. For those that saw Thrive, the movie, or the documentary, you'll see that beautiful image there, these giant vo uh, uh, toroid vortex um, energy fields that seem to be at the foundation of everything in, in our reality, from the tiniest atom to the cells in our bodies, to the, uh, to the energy fields around us, to our solar system, to our galaxy, to the greater universe. We accidentally put one of these stones, and we started measuring these weird energy fields around these, these donut-shaped stones, and I realized, well, hold on, we're dealing with some really powerful energy fields being generated from this thing. And, uh, and when you stack them on top of each other, it goes ballistic. Um, and then we uh, accidentally, my friend Neil put one of these in a bucket of water. And when he woke up in the morning, this is the best photograph he could take, he started, he saw thousands of tiny bubbles that created a spiral vortex and they're moving, spiraling around into the center of the hole, uh, showing us that there's this energy field created around these, these donut-shaped stones. And you suddenly realize that because of this energy, this power that these stones create, 
and they were created, given to humanity by the gods. This is most likely why these beads are worth their weight in gold, because they were mimicking, and they were little tiny little miniature um, you know, uh, copies of these sacred stones that could perform miracles and create energy fields and manifest things and do all kinds of stuff that the people didn't quite understand. Well, I took one of these stones, my best example to Nassim Haramein last year, exactly about this time last year. Louise and I packed it up. We're going to do a presentation. Uh, I believe I was the first person ever, ever invited to do a presentation to his research team there in Hawaii at the Resonance Research Project. And that stone is now with Nassim. I'm still waiting to hear what they've done with it, what research they've done. Um, <clears throat> I packed it in my bag and uh, packed, wrapped it up in, silly, in, in bubble wrap and put it in my bag. And Louise and I left for, for um, Doha on Qatar Airlines. We had a few hours layover, at which point we got onto another plane heading for Chicago, USA. At which point my bag went through Homeland Security or NSA security. And so we're sitting on the plane, waiting to take off, and the captain already said, okay, close doors and cross-check and blah, blah, blah. And 15 minutes later, we're still sitting there while the doors open. And suddenly we hear on the intercom, Louise Clark, please identify yourself. Or in some other Arabic accent, uh, not Afrikaans. And, um, and uh, I looked at Louise and I went, what have you done? And... She puts her hand up, and the hostess comes running along, and she goes, you must follow me off the plane, ma'am. And I go, no way, I'm not letting you off the plane on your own. You know, maybe this isn't a Midnight Express movie. Come visit you in the Turkish prison for the next 12 years. So I go off the plane with her, and, uh, and there are five guys with guns around my bag on the tarmac next to the plane. And I go, that's my bag. It's not Louise's bag. So lots of confusion. They send Louise back up the stairs. She's standing in the door. And, uh, and, I'm, and I say, open, the, open your bag. So there's a security thread in your bag. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, it's the stone in my bag. I forgot about it. So I'm opening it. And I'm thinking, what am I going to tell them? And I can't tell them it's ancient technology. And it's confiscated, you know. It's like, you know what happens when they find ancient technology? Just look at Iraq, you know. Look at, uh, look at the, what happens in the Near East. Every time they find new technology, the black helicopters and close the space down because they can't let people discover we've got ancient technology. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, and I'm telling him, oh, it's African curios. It's from a present from my friend in Hawaii. It's African curios. It's a special stone. Uh, that's, I got away with that. By the time I opened it up, I felt like a drug dealer. You know, so it's a tight, so tightly wrapped in, in bubble wrap, and it's like, and it's heavy, and 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 these guys are getting very nervous. You know how difficult it is to break that tape? It's very strong. Without scissors, it's virtually impossible to open. So it took me a little while to open that bloody thing. By this time, these guys are so nervous and jittery, they don't know what's coming out of that bubble wrap. And eventually, the stone pops out, and there's one African guy among them, and he goes, oh, I've seen those before, and he turns around and walks away. So lots of confusion, put it back, uh, and up the stairs, and, and um, by the time the captain had come out, and he was standing next to Louise, and he said to her, if this plane isn't up, uh, isn't up in the air in the next two minutes, I'm offloading the whole plane. So lots of commotion. And eventually we get back and we sit down and the doors close and we start taking off. And all the way while I'm walking back up, I'm thinking to myself, the stone works. <laughs> and, uh, and I had no idea how well the stone worked. Because when we sat down, Louise turned to me and said, do you know what the captain said when he came out of the cockpit? He said that whatever is in that bag crashed the TSA security system. That's why all the commotion that's how powerful that technology is. We're dealing with truly advanced technology and possibly one of the most important hints of where we should be getting our zero point of free electricity or free energy from, from these toroid donut-shaped stones that are not weights for digging sticks, that are very advanced technology. And this, thanks to Homeland and TSA security, we have proof and evidence of them being advanced technology. Because <laughs> it certainly wasn't my toothbrush that set it off. <laughs> now, we have half an hour. Earth grids. Hugh will tell you a lot about these earth grids. Many, much science and research has been done. This is a Russian map showing us that many of the ancient sites are built on these nodal points, energy points, these crossing energy points, energy vortexes. You can see Adam's calendar down there seems to be built on one. 
per, a geyser permit. There's something in the middle there that we need to go and explore. But in any case, the, these ancient sites are built on these very powerful energetic points, not just randomly built. And this is beautifully described in this Sumerian text. And when you start seeing this kind of information, it says, in the distant days, in those days after destinies had been decreed, after Un and Enlil set up the regulations for heaven and earth. These are clearly very powerful individuals, people. They set up the regulations for heaven and earth. And then Enki, the exalted knowing God, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up cities. They're telling us that there's some set of rules, energetic structure in the sky that's mirrored on the surface of the earth. And according to this grid, this energetic grid or the structure, they put the cities in place. And this is spectacular because you realize that this is exactly what the American um, uh, uh, military and, and, and Space Command Air Force logos embed. They are encoded with this information. They, these bands around their logos, those wide bands around planet Earth, are referred to as the rules. This is, uh, I believe, David Wilcock was the first guy to really break this several years ago, and they refer to those as the rules. They say it's like an energy field around the planet. They don't know where it comes from, but it's always been there. And now we find an interesting correlation between ancient Sumerian texts about these rules of heaven and earth and these logos and the military emblems. And this takes us to other ancient sites um, and showing us advanced technology on a gigantic scale. And this is just one such example in Egypt. You see these giant stones sticking out of the ground, these obelisks that are nothing less or nothing more than a giant antennae. And I realize that that when you start looking at these, it just doesn't make any sense, you know, because we get confused. We get told by our historians and archaeologists, these are temples for worshiping. You have to go over there, worship over there, then you offer food over there, then you go kiss butt over there, and if you don't kiss butt the correct way, you're going to be smited. There was a lot of smiting going on in ancient times. Keep, don't forget about that. So, if, you know, you've got to follow these rules and procedures, and God, if you get it wrong, phew, you better have some seriously good contacts, otherwise you're in deep trouble, and your children's children will be in deep trouble as well, because you didn't kiss butt in the right bloody chamber. And, um, and you know, I realized too many pillars, not enough space, doesn't make any sense. And then we were there 2012 with Hugh, and this little piece was lying there. I put my ear next to it, and Hugh tapped on it on the one side, and I realized, oh my God, these, these obelisks ring like bells, just like the stones in South Africa. And I realized it's all sound-based technology, sound-based, silicon-based technology. Most of these stones, it's mostly silica, people. Once again, we get back to the silica. And I started thinking, too many pillars, not enough space, doesn't make any, any sense that this, is, this should be places of worship. Not enough space for people. And, and you start looking at some of the aerial shots and you realize that, look at that, congestion of pillars and those weird geometrical patterns over there. Many of them don't seem to have very defined entrances and doors. They just look really weird kind of random structures. Um, and, uh, and then even the Parthenon, when you look around the Parthenon, there's, there seems to be an imprint of a, the leftover of, a, of a, a foundation, of a geometric foundation that's been broken down, only the, the major pillar structure being left behind. And then the entrance portal to it over there. The, again, the walls and the pillars, too many pillars in there. Why all these pillars in this confined space? And then you see, see things like this, and we get told, this is like Parthenon-like structures. That's where you go and offer food here. You go worship over there. And then that place on the left, that's where the people lived. And they would come here and worship and offer food and do some more butt kissing uh, and whatever they had to do. And then you do, and you find these kind of things, these these concentric circles in front of a platform filled with pillars and another Parthenon-like structure there with nothing in it. And you realize that these are not temples for worshiping. These are templates. Templates for what? Templates for giant circuit boards, silicon-based technology. That's what we're dealing with here. This has got nothing to do with worshiping gods and, and offering food, but very advanced technology, sound-based technology, giant circuit boards generating huge amount of sound energy and either putting it into the sky with the, those giant obelisk needles or sucking something out of the sky. And you start seeing, once you see this, everything changes and our understanding of the reason for these temples that later were abused for completely the wrong reasons and suddenly microprocessors become giant macroprocessors of unimaginable proportion. 
using silicon-based technology in ways that we can't imagine today. And uh, suddenly everything changes. And we realize that these are not places of worship. And that's not where the people used to live. That's part of the circuit board on the left. And this whole thing is just a, an ongoing circuit board. And, and, and if you combine silica and water, the two most abundant elements on planet Earth, uh, you realize that water has the same properties. It conducts light and sound. It, it stores knowledge and information. It stores and conducts energy. If you combine silica and water, my God, you've got a very powerful device that can do things that we can only dream of right now as we sit here. And even the Mayas start to encode the information of uh, circuit boards into the artwork and the pyramids are just spectacular. I just love the pyramids because this one specifically is just so, <laughs> so awesome. It's like, oh yes, we're looking at a giant energy generating device and the rules for heaven and earth tell us that there is an energy grid around planet earth that is encoded in the modern military and air force logos. And how is this energy grid around the earth put in place? They used human sound, human energy, to feed the needs of these ETs. And, uh, and Parthenon is just one such example. This is why they put these huge amphitheaters close by. You fill the amphitheater with a lot of people. You fill them with fear. You get them excited. They make a hell of a lot of noise. You know how noisy these, these uh, soccer stadiums get. You can't even hear. The, the players can't hear each other on the field. That's how much noise we create as spectators. You get those into the amphitheater. You get them filled with fear because they fear smiting. Remember, a lot of smiting going on. And it's connected to the circuit board. You get them to activate it, and it's probably, by the looks of it, human sound that was activated to activate these circuit boards. Here's another example. There's your amphitheater with a beautiful resonating line of, of pillars that connect it to the circuit board. And it's obviously badly destroyed. And, and here's another one. On top of the mountain, there's your circuit board right in the middle of the mountain. There's your amphitheater that feeds it and kickstarts the process. And this is what we're dealing with, with giant technology, huge silicon-based technology. The question is, what do we do with all this information? What have we learned from all of this stuff? It's really interesting stuff, isn't it? But this is where my real interest starts to kick in. Because if we just see this as a curiosity, then it's completely useless and a complete waste of time. Go home, put a gun to your head and pull the trigger because it's not going to get you anywhere. It's just going to make you wonder more about what the hell was going on in the past. How we can apply this to the savior of our planet and the prosperity of our species is far more important. And this, I believe, brings us to the 2012 prophecy and the crossing of the galactic plane, which was not just a celestial or a cosmic event, it was a physical event. Why was it a physical event? Because when our solar system crossed this galactic plane, uh, in many ways it's still busy crossing it. And what is encoded in that galactic equator, that galactic plane, all the intense frequencies of, the gala of our galaxy is focused and, and concentrated in the galactic equator. Well, we've just crossed that. What does that do to us? Those frequencies activated our DNA, and it activated all that juicy part, all that important part, the 97 or more percent of our DNA that's supposed to be the junk DNA. No, that's where all the good stuff sits that is now being awoken. And this is why millions of people around the world wake up every day and they're no longer happy with their lot in life. They no longer want to feel enslaved. They're no longer happy with the answers that our authorities and our governments and our banks are giving us. They want to ask new questions. They're no longer fearful. They think of new things. Suddenly out of nowhere they pull new questions that they were too scared to ask the day before. This is the true age of enlightenment, the new golden age as the ancients predicted. We will reach and enter in 2012. We are it, people. We are the people we've been waiting for. So pat yourself on the shoulder that you're here today, that you recognize this, that you understand that it is up to us what we do with this knowledge and information and take this into this awakening moment in all of human history. A rapid rise of consciousness is exploding around the planet. How do I know this? I can tell you from personal experience. The fact that the Ubuntu movement has members in more than 210 countries around the world is a clear indication of that rapid rise of consciousness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few minutes. So, 
We all know that we are born free. Think about that little newborn baby in your hands. When you look down on that baby, it is completely free. It's born into this world, absolutely innocent and filled with wonder. And many of the new babies filled with very specific missions that they have to accomplish. <laughs> so we're born free on this planet. And yet from that moment we are born, we cannot move around freely. We cannot live where we choose to. We need passports and we need work permits to earn money, to survive. We have to follow rules and laws that we did not agree to. I did not agree to any of the rules and laws that are being imposed on me when I was born. And I bet none of you did. None of you agreed to be a citizen, but you were forced to be a citizen. You're not a citizen. You're a living, breathing human being, but you have to call yourself a citizen. And the moment you do that, you become a number that is represented by a barcode in your ID document, and you realize that you've been enslaved in a system that none of us could have imagined. It is so deep and dark and convoluted that when you first discover it, many of us simply refuse to believe it, and we kick and scream and fight, and we call others conspiracy theorists, and we call them horrible names because we cannot imagine that it could, there could be a, a group of beings or a system or a government so brutal that they could enforce such a system on beautiful human beings. And yet, that is the terrible truth we have to face. But now that we know it, we know what to do about it because that's exactly what it is. We are born into slavery. We live on a prison planet. That's what this is. How we take this forward, what we do with this information, is up to each and every one of you here. And millions of the people around the world, thousands and thousands that I've spoken to around the Americas and Europe and now Australia and so forth, it's up to us what we do with us. How did it get so bad? Well, the Sumerian texts tell us very clearly. When kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven by the Anunnaki or the Elohim, and don't confuse those two. That's a long debate. Okay? Don't get confused by that. Some 6,000 or whatever years ago, when a small group of royal political bloodlines took control of the world, when those first priest kings were appointed, these two Sumerian kings let's tell us the names of the kings. They tell us how long they ruled. And they tell us that the first priest kings were appointed by the gods to rule over humanity. To rule over them, they were given specific knowledge from where we get the secret societies. And they were given special weapons and powers and knowledge of, of alchemy and wizardry and, and all and sorcery and all this stuff. And that's what they've kept secret for thousands and thousands of years. That's how they've kept control. These royal bloodlines, these first priest kings that were appointed by the gods, have ruled this planet for thousands and thousands of years. And the same bloodlines continue to rule the earth for thousands today, these same bloodlines that you can trace back. What did these first priest kings do? One of the first things they did was to create money. Money is not a consequence or evolution of thousands of years of barter and trade. That's one of the big lies that we've been told. Because if they keep the evolution of money alongside the evolution of humans and human consciousness, we'll believe that that's part of our, our existence, that we have to have money to survive, which is one of the biggest lies we've been told. And you realize that these first priest kings were also the first bankers, okay? The temples were the first banks, and these first priest kings issued money in the forms of clay tablets. The first promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instruments were issued like this clay tablet here, which is in the British Museum, for all of us to see. But we walk past it, and we have no idea what we're looking at. One of the first evidence of human enslavement, probably the oldest bill of exchange in the world, 4,000 year of bill, of bill of exchange. Same things the bankers do to us today, except they do it on paper, not in clay. Paper can burn, clay doesn't. So luckily this is preserved for us. <laughs> so the same first priest kings that were the bankers and the temples that were the banks, the same royal banking bloodlines still run the world today. We know who they are. They make money out of thin air. And this is why we are all in deep, deep trouble. Our central bank does not belong to the people. It does not belong to the government. It is not there for the benefit of the people. It's a private company that enslaves everyone, that is being given absolute free reign to run havoc and destroy every single one of us, turning us into debt slaves from the moment we are born. We know who these families are. They run all the central banks in the world. And uh, <laughs> I'm running out of time. 
But uh, we just had a crazy email from, uh, I forget his name now. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. He was involved with a reserve bank, and uh, he is now a lecturer at this institution, at Wits University, who has a, absolute no idea what's going on in the world of finance and the enslavement of humanity. Um, and clearly, the entire global banking system controls the education system because they're creating future work labor force, a future workforce. It's not about creating skills for life. What skills do we have when we leave school? Nothing. We can't even bake a bloody loaf of bread. We can't grow food. We can't build an energy device. We, can't, we don't know how to create electricity. We, we know nothing, but we get a certificate with which we do what? We go looking for a job. Oh, yeah, I've got a certificate. I'll need a job. There are no jobs. And this is the terrible truth that our children today have to face. It doesn't matter how many certificates you have from how many universities or schools. There are no jobs. Those are just enslavement patterns to keep the money trap going. And most of the students that leave school today are so indebted to the banks that they spend the rest of their lives just paying their student loans off. So you see how this trap has been woven so mirac <laughs> maliciously, meticulously is the word I was looking for, <laughs> around us. Money controls the walls. You know this. They always, they always fund both sides because they benefit from the huge amounts of money that wars generate. The Second World War is just a beautiful example and the manipulation of Hitler. And then obviously the, the whole Iraq and, and, and Middle East war. And the governments and large, and large corporations have stolen the country from its people. We all believe that the country belongs to its people, right? That's what our Constitution says. Well, guess what? It's called the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. What is the Republic of South Africa? It's a corporation. It's not the land called South Africa. And this is the little twist of the words. When they say the Republic of South Africa and they mix it with South Africa, they th we think they're referring to the same thing. No, it's a very clever deception. South Africa is a very different thing from the Republic of South Africa. And this is how they pull the wool over our eyes, because all our countries are corporations, all listed on the U.S. Securities Exchange, all our birth certificates are traded, we are the commodities, we are the slave, slaves, we are the stock that is traded. This is why when you're born, your parents are forced to sign a birth certificate. Why on earth would you have to do that? To prove who you are? You know who you are. Here I am. I am here. I am who I say because I say so. Here I stand, flesh and blood. I don't need a piece of paper to prove that I'm alive. I'm talking to you for God's sake. You know that I'm alive. Why do I need a piece of paper? When I was up against the bank, and I'm really running out of time, in the court, I was hoping for an opportunity to prove to them that I'm a living, breathing human being and that I'm not a piece of paper. I was going to take a six-inch nail and say, if you believe that I am this piece of paper, let me prove to you that I'm not. If I drive a six-inch nail through my heart, I will surely die. So let me drive a six-inch nail through my ID document and see if I'm still alive. And I, you know what the outcome is, right? Oh, my goodness. It's just, I'm still standing there. What's going on? You know? You are not the piece of paper. Here's evidence. There's Anglo-American. This is a, a, a page download from uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange um, search for Companies, company search, Anglo-American, government of the Republic of South Africa, that's also a, a corporation. And you've got Larson, whatever, Lehman Brothers, uh, New South African Front, Old Mutual, uh, and then the Republic of South Africa. And then go down in my favorite bank, Standard Bank of South Africa, right down there as well, right next to our country and our government. And, uh, and the rest of the world, just go do some research, you'll find that every country, every province, every city, everything is incorporated. It's all about corporations, and this is our laws. This is why our laws and our judiciary has nothing to do with upholding the rights of human beings. It's about upholding the rights of the corporations that have been put in place. So this is what we have to circumvent, people. Now we know this stuff. We realize that money does not make the world go round. I can't see any money anywhere, can you? It's a beautiful image without any money. I was very confused when I saw this picture. I kept looking for the money. Couldn't find it. Still can't find it. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It's the absolute tool of control. It is not about the money. Don't ever get confused. It's about the control of the money. OK? 
Okay? It's not about the money. They can create as much money and print as much money as they want. It's about using the money as a tool of control. And many people argue and they say it's, it's, not, the, it's, not, the, 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 it's not the love of it's not the money, it's the love of money. No, it's not the love of money, it's the presence of money that causes all this problem. And this is where we need to start realizing that we have to find a new system. We've been using this for thousands of years now, it doesn't work for us, and we need to find a new system. And this is, we cannot fix the system, we cannot fix the problems with the tools that created the problem. So what is the only solution? The only solution is to get rid of the money. That is the problem. Until we have money in our lives, in our systems, in our societies, we will forever find corrupt people, those that will try and um, control others, manipulate others, abuse others. That will forever be the case. And there are great examples throughout human history where people existed for thousands of years in very abundant communities without money. The moment you ask that question or suggest that, the obvious questions pop up. Who's going to shovel the crap? I'll just sit on my ass and do nothing. If there's no money, then I want 50 Ferraris and 20 mansions, and how are we going to pay for things, and, and are we going back to the dark ages without money? No. All these questions, and I bet you're thinking them as I'm reading them out, because they actually make part of the 13 most frequently asked questions. If you get my book, Ubuntu Contributionism, you'll see the frequently asked questions. And I've been doing this for 10 years now, since 2005. And can I tell you, I've had hundreds of thousands of questions thrown at me, and it's still standing. It cannot be knocked over. The moment you remove money from the system, it becomes infallible because it's always the money that corrupts. It corrupts the people, it corrupts the system, it corrupts our, our um, souls, it corrupts our integrity. It is the cancer in our lives, in humanity. A world without money, there is no crime. Think about these things. There's no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no hoarding, no hierarchy necessary. There are no obstacles to any kind of progress because we do things because we love to do it and we choose to do it in community. We call this contributionism. The ancients in Africa called it Ubuntu. It's a very simple system that operates on people working together in united communities, working together for the greatest benefit of all rather in, in cooperation, rather than working in competition for the destruction of their community. And that's really what it's all about, people. Think about that word, competition. We've been told all our lives that competition is good. Competition is good. No. Competition is the worst thing that's ever been imposed on humanity. Cooperation is what we, we should be operating under. Cooperating for the greatest benefit of all. Let a scientist cooperate to develop and invent the best scientific solutions for everything and then give it to humanity. Let the farmers and the, the food growers uh, do that in the same way, Create, work in cooperation to provide food for their communities and so forth, not compete against each other so they can put a logo on it and sell it for a higher price so they make a better profit. That's what this is all about. Contributionism has a five-point mantra. It's very simple. No money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything. Everyone contributes their skills for the greatest benefit of all in their community. It's that simple. Now, I've been saying that it's so simple you can't screw it up. And like I said, after thousands and thousands of questions, no matter what problem you throw at this situation, it always corrects itself for the best possible outcome for the whole community and all the individuals in that community. That's why it's such a beautiful, simple system. Why is it so simple? Because it follows the laws of nature. It is not a it's not a construct of humanity. We're following the laws of nature. We're doing what comes naturally, what nature does in abundance around us. We're now applying it to our own lives, working together for the greatest harmony. The rivers do not charge the trees and the grass for using the water. <laughs> so, what do people need? Food, water, love, friendship, homes, tables, chairs, all these amazing things, arts, culture, everything we can imagine. We don't need money. Money does nothing. People do everything. It's the people that plant the seeds, that build the bridges, that build the rockets and create the technology. Money does nothing. It keeps getting in the way between what people want to do and what they're good at and what they're allowed to do. If you don't have the money, you can't do that. Oh, sorry, you can't have a bakery. You know, the best baker in town, but uh, our economic model shows that it's not economically viable for you to feed your community. Now, isn't that a crime against humanity? Of course it is. People create the arts and culture. 
Money cannot do that. Only people have the capacity for infinite love. Money cannot do that. It destroys all these infinitely divine human traits. How do we get there? Step by step. We cannot get from here to there in one giant step. It's going to have to be step by step. I believe that it'll come in small towns and communities because they're a lot easier to get people to unite and start working together. I believe we have to use money to get rid of money itself and this is why the Ubuntu movement is going on about creating an, a people's bank that creates money for the people, by the people, tax-free and interest-free, taking it away from a control of a private corporation called the South African Reserve Bank. Once we have money available for everything we need in our communities, people will realize very quickly that if we have money available for everything all the time and it's for the benefit of everyone, why do we need the money? Why do we need to go and get the money to build the bridge? Why do we just build the bridge? And very slowly we'll start moving away from our obsession and thinking that money makes the world go round. Transforming small towns and villages into communities of abundance, not self-sustaining communities. That's the big difference between contributionism and self-sustained communities. Contributionism creates communities that create abundance. Three times as much as what they need so that one third is consumed and the other two thirds are made available to the communities around them for a fraction of the price in the beginning, which means that you bring all the people from your surrounding communities, they buy all the stuff from you, which immediately collapses their economic, financial, capitalistic model. The moment you've achieved this as a tiny little community, you will have an immediate ripple effect and all the communities around you. This is one of the models. Using an alternative source of energy to, to, to float this whole thing. If you can provide an alternative source of energy that's free to the people, almost free, you can then introduce the concept of contributionism on a weekly basis. You will have free electricity. All you have to do for that is to work for three hours a week in one of the community projects. And now suddenly you see the abundance, whether it's the dairy, the fish farm, the recycling, the bakery, the, elec the, ele the, the, the whatever it is you can imagine, just fill in the gaps. Suddenly you're creating a town of a thousand people. You've got 3,000 hours a week of labor that you'll have, people working and con contributing towards community projects. We can't imagine that kind of abundance because the capitalism does not allow for this kind of abundance to happen. And all you do is use free electricity as a platform for this. And suddenly you realize, this is why electricity and energy is probably one of the most fiercely guarded sectors of our society. Because once people have free alternative electricity and energy, everything changes. The way we travel, the way we are probably not going to drive on roads but levitate in in, in different vehicles, that we're not going to need to live in cities, we can live in communities of your choice. Everything we do will change completely. If you start thinking about that, you'll see how rapidly your outlook on a utopian Ubuntu contributionist community changes. The electricity, the free energy, is the catalyst for all of this. And as you may know, we are sitting on thousands and thousands of free electricity devices out there. There are many brilliant minds out there that have given us free electricity. I've shown you the stone is a free electricity device. All we have to do is put some sound into it and figure out how to harness that energy that comes out of it. Because if it can crash the TSA system in Doha, it can certainly do many other things. So. We need to create an alternative education system. We cannot send, keep sending our children into the concentration camps that deprive them from unlimited thinking, putting them into these prison cells of left-brain prisons and right-brain prisons and turning our children into marching soldiers to the beat of the capitalistic drum. This is what needs to change. Imagine if your child is taught true skills for life from the earliest of time by master teachers in our community, teachers that are chosen by the community, not imposed on us by our government. Not that I don't like teachers, but unfortunately the education system is structured in this way. And many teachers out there would love to teach real truth and true skills for life, but they're forced to teach the textbooks that, that, that are put in their hands. Imagine if your child and we are taught true skills for life, from growing seeds to building electricity devices to building bridges to, um, to blowing glass to whatever it is you can imagine. Um, by the time you're 16 years old, you will know how to do each and every one of those things. You're not going to be able to just regurgitate it from a textbook. You'll be able to build a bridge or create a rocket and, and build a computer from scratch. 
you're not just going to have a certificate that says somebody has to give you a job. And this is what these Ubuntu communities are all about, creating people that perform their labor of love for their community. By the time you're 16 years old, everybody will know what you're truly good at. And you will know exactly what your God-given talents and passions are, what you will want to contribute to your community or do for the rest of your life. And I believe that my early models of thinking that you'd have to contribute three hours a day of your, of your personal uh, skills and talents and then three hours a week for your community, that model is rapidly falling away. I think that by the time we get this off the ground, three hours a week in a community project is probably going to be all we need because everything we do from the master shoemakers to the master glass blowers to the master bridge builders to the master rocket builders everything will be driven by master uh, teachers in our communities and we'll go from one to the other as a community project learning these skills and constantly expanding our mind while prov providing abundance beyond our wildest imagination so stop chasing the money only in unity we thrive and anything is possible and I'm going to end here by saying that only out of unity comes infinite diversity and abundance. Why can I make such a silly statement? Some people think that we're creating drones because we want to be all the same. No. Think of the body. Trillions of cells together working in united harmony for the best outcome of your entire body. Not competing against each other. Not killing and destroying each other. Working together so that your whole body benefits. Start seeing your community as an extension of your body. Everyone working together for the greatest benefit of the whole community. Not fighting or competing against each other. That's the system that we need to move into. We don't need money to do that. And this is why we don't need to fight the bankers. We can just certainly circumvent them by creating abundance for ourselves, by working together, not needing their money at all. Contributionism. We were the Ubuntu party was in the South African elections. As a result of that, so much has happened. We don't have time for that. It's a global explosion of Ubuntu philosophy, Ubuntu consciousness. We now have members, as I mentioned, in more than 200 countries. As we speak, Ubuntu parties are being formed in Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Austria, and United States. In Canada, we know for sure that the Ubuntu party will be contesting the elections in 2015. And so the consciousness explosion starts. All the information is in my new book, Ubuntu Contributionism, and this is the good news, a blueprint for human prosperity, because that's what this is all about, learning from the ancients, applying it for the benefit of humanity today. What we do need to do is, um, these are just some of the projects in Vardafal Burfen, but I'm going to stop and tell you, go out there and tell everyone, be a seed of consciousness. Don't keep this information to yourself. Don't be afraid of it. See, to communicate telepathically through the pineal gland and through our thoughts, then you can start controlling people. And this information is deeply encoded in the ancient symbolisms. You see winged beings and other deities with cone-shaped tools taking control of humanity with these weird-looking cone-shaped tools. You see it on symbols in the Vatican and all over the world in historic um, examples. These cone-shaped tools become very important, and you start realizing that they start taking control of our pineal gland and the tree of life, or DNA, which seems to be with sound frequency devices. These cone-shaped tools, and why do I say it's sound frequencies? You'll understand soon why I say this if you haven't figured it out yet. And you know what this ancient control carries on today? Cone-shaped tools, all-seeing eye of Horus, sound frequency. Well, that's exactly how radio and television and communication has kept us enslaved and keeps us enslaved. You can see the encoded all-seeing eye of Horus there at CBS. And, and look at the cone-shaped tools in the logo of NBC. And you start realizing that this is so deeply encoded all around us, but we're just so bloody stupid and ignorant. We're like little babies waking up to the truth, looking up at the skies, going, what the hell is going on out there? While well, there's all this infinite life out there looking down upon us saying how can they be so stupid they're imbued with all this information in their dna and they're not getting what we're trying to tell them and this is the exciting thing is we're finally waking up to these key people communicating with us and telling us and giving us this information that's thousands of years being shoving down our throats but then you got to ask yourself well what is the sound thing and most of us have no bloody idea what sound is because we still believe that sound is a squeal on a whiteboard that we were learned at school right oh this is a sound wave this is, this is how it works and the, and that could screw you up for life really because that's what you go out believing 
And this is what we re- have to start really looking into this depth of, of, the, of this sound and resonance and how it affects everything around us. There's a beautiful example of John Stuart Reed's fantastic work with a cymoscope and, and, and photographing three-dimensional effects of what sound really is. Sound manifests form and manifests physical shape. You know when you put sand on a metal plate and you put a sound frequency through it, it gives you these infinite number of beautiful shapes. We don't have enough time for that, but many of you know this already. If not, go out and put these things into YouTube. If you need to research this or verify any of this, go into YouTube, put, put the information in, and you will find lots and lots of beautiful visual examples of what I'm referring to here, especially this one here as well. So, sound is a three. dimensional effect that happens from the source and it goes in all directions and just because you can't hear it doesn't mean it's not there remember that's the other important thing we can only hear a very specific very limited frequency range sound and resonance sound levitates and if you don't know this go onto YouTube once again look at find the the video clips that shows you how sound actually levitates objects but that is not how the ancients used to do it. Do not get confused by the levitation videos that we find on YouTube and the way the ancients did it. The current levitation sound technology is just basically pressure waves used with sound waves, um, standing waves that are crossed over, and it, it captures the little objects in the standing waves. That's not the, the ancients did it. The ancients used, uh, used sound uh, in the form of um, hypersound, where sound travels beyond the speed of light. And that's news to some people. They've never heard of this. How can sound travel beyond the speed of light? Well, that's one of the best kept secrets of science and physics. Never published. To a, well, it was published, but never put it on the 8 o'clock news because we can't tell people that. If we tell them that sound can move beyond the speed of light, they'll get some clever ideas, and we can't do that. So let's just keep it away from the mainstream media. And, uh, and this is how we just keep getting enslaved and bamboozled and, and remain stupid. So sound boils water. It creates light. God said, let there be light, right? Uh, it creates DNA. Yes, it does. It heals. It destroys pathogens. Sound moves beyond the speed of light, as I mentioned. It's known, often referred to as hypersound by modern uh, researchers and scientists. And it creates SASER technology as opposed to laser technology. SASER stands for sound amplified by stimulated emission of radiation as opposed to light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation. Now, remember, SASER technology was only discovered in 2009. It's relatively new to our civilization, and yet the ancients seem to have been using this for thousands of years. And the most important thing is that sound is a precursor to electromagneticism, not the other way around. Sound can be seen as the breath of the Creator, and it is what I refer to as the prime resonance frequency. Everything in creation vibrates in coherent harmony. That is how it can stay together. That is how things can all function together and interact and interlock. This is the foundation for what some people refer to as the morphogenetic field out of which all information comes. It is the breath of the Creator, the resonance of the utterance of everything into existence. And this is why we were taught for, what is it, nearly 60 years now by the brilliant information in Star Trek. And in Star Trek refers to it as the prime directive. And they tell, keep telling us that you cannot breach the prime directive, which is really just referring to the prime resonance frequency. You cannot go against that because what happens? It's just like your body. It resonates in one giant coherent uh, organism. What we find out when we start looking at the origins of humankind, and the deeper you delve into this, the more you realize how really exciting this is, that the history is so much more important, so much more impressive, and so much more um, wilder than we could have imagined. And it's much older and more exciting than most of us could have imagined. And uh, I call it, uh, in Germany, I called it funky, and the Germans really seem to have appreciated that word funky. So I'll say the history of humanity is far more funky than most of us could have imagined. And that just, you know, if we keep our minds open to the possibilities, 
uh, it really allows us to stretch ourselves into areas that many people uh, are not prepared to go. And that's truly what I found is the moment you think you start, that you, you believe you start, you've started to understand the history of this planet, you're making a mistake. We're looking at millions of years, we're looking at billions of years of history, not just a few thousand years like our historians and our anthropologists and our archaeologists keep shoving down our throats. We're dealing with a mysterious planet here. And one such example is this giant footprint near the border of Swaziland, near a place called Impaluzi. And this is a huge mystery and an anomaly, how such a giant footprint could have happened and emerged in granite. The fact that it's in granite itself shows us that we know nothing about geology, how geological formations actually happened, what is behind the, the geology around us, um, how it materializes, and we need to put a new thinking cap on and go back. So the interesting thing about this footprint is that it's about four feet tall, which would have been made by about a seven and a half meter giant. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because my friend Klaus Donner from Vienna found the remains of a giant that was about seven and a half meters tall in Ecuador, which has been histologically tested and scientifically tested and, and uh, concluded that it was a humanoid being that would have been about seven and a half meters tall. And so we start to look at this really wild history of this planet that many people are not prepared to go and, and absorb and embrace. And uh, that takes us to the fact that, that the moment you start looking and exploring the origins of humankind, you get to my favorite subject, and is, that is sound and resonance. You cannot escape this, no matter the beautiful, um, I think this is um, um, uh, Mr. Dunn's brilliant work on studying the pyramids. And this is supported by this ridiculous photograph that clearly shows us that there's some weird energy coming out of the pyramids. You know, certain filters can film things that you cannot see with your eyes, and this is just one such example. And then the studies in the, in the, uh, that have been done at Stonehenge show us some beautiful symmetrical patterns that come out of, of Stonehenge that clearly tell us that this was done on purpose. This is a, this is a, a, a structure that was done by design for very specific um, outcomes, and this tells us there's intelligence behind it, symmetrical interference patterns that do not happen accidentally in a structure like that. Um, there'd be chaos. It shows us, and this beautiful reconstruction shows us that Stonehenge is definitely something like a resonator or an energy device, just like the stone circles in South Africa. Some of you may already be aware of that. Um, but sound and frequency was used to control and manipulate humanity. And this is where it gets, starts to get really sinister. And we realize that this information is, is further encoded in ancient symbology. The pineal gland is clearly a representation uh, represented by the all-seeing eye of Horus. And this, this kind of anatomy and the control of humanity, it starts to, um, starts to rise to the sinister and what many people call um, uh, conspiracy theories, right? There's, there are no conspiracies. There's just information. It's what you do with that information that matters, right? So uh, remember that when you take control, when I speak to you, you can't see the sound frequencies, right? Can you see the sound frequencies going to your ears? No, and yet you can understand me. Does, does everybody here understand what I'm saying? Y yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Let me? Let's put this way. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. So basically, uh, if you can't see it and you can't touch it, it means it must be magic, right? Because that's what some people argue with you. If I can't see it or can't touch it, I won't believe it. You wanna, I want to see physical proof, otherwise you're just an asshole trying to lie to me. Well, you know, <laughs> so what's the difference between the sound waves leaving my, my mouth that you can't see and yet you can still hear me and understand me and the thought waves that leave, leave my brain? Same thing, it's just frequencies and waves. And the fact that we cannot understand each other through telepathy clearly shows us that that is one of the ways that you can control humanity. If you can't read somebody's mind and you don't know what they are thinking, you can lie to them. And this is why the sound thing has become very important. It becomes a tool of deception. You can lie to people by telling them things and they believe that what they hear is true if you repeat it over and over and over again. And this is the beautiful part of the deception and the enslavement of our race is severing us from ourselves, from our ability, what books you read, what civilizations you, you, uh, you look at. Sooner or later, you will come across this phrase, sound and or resonance. And that's where everything starts to congeal and start to paint a beautiful picture of our, our understanding of what's really going on. Sound and resonance are the common links 
of, religious, of religions and creation, and you can't escape that. In Christianity, we have the Word, God said, let there be light, and it's important, just that sequence, said, light, sound, and light. That's a very important sequence here that we, we start finding. In Hinduism, we have the Om or the Aum. Egyptians believe that the universe was sung into creation, and this Hindu creation story is just phenomenal. And it's, this is the beautiful thing. When you start connecting these dots, you realize that the ancients are telling us the same information in different words, and it gets really exciting. And we start coming face to face with this number six, the six days of creation, that very quickly can be uh, explained with sacred geometry. And you realize that the sacred geometry subject is a huge subject that we need to embrace because it's from sacred geometry sacred geometry that we get all our wisdom and knowledge in mathematics, physics, geometry, astronomy, and so forth. All the knowledge of creation comes from this very simple study. And, um, and mathematicians and scientists that do not embrace this keep running into dead-end walls and dead-end streets before they start to realize that they need to embrace this knowledge and this information. Six days of creation on the seventh day God rested. In Hinduism we have, uh, and Buddhism we have the six aspects of Om and uh, then we have the Mayan creation story, which is equally beautiful. The heart of sky and six other deities, including the feathered serpent, wanted to create human beings with hearts and minds who could keep the days. And you realize that we're getting into a lot more sinister kind of creation story that keeps a lot more secrets than we imagine. Uh, six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. For those that understand resonance ratios will realize, oh, that's, what's, that's what this is all about. It's actually about resonance, resonant harmonic ratios and resonant frequencies, coherent resonance that starts to pull things together. And we realize, when we ask ourselves, what does this all have to do with ancient civilizations? Well, everything, because they understood this, and this is why they leave this information encoded in everything they leave behind for us. The symbols, the knowledge, the information is encoded with all this knowledge, and all we have to do is just open our minds and embrace this and absorb this information and see how it all connects. They understood sound, they understood frequency, and they use it as a source of energy. And for many people that have studied this, it becomes very obvious. I've been saying this for a long time, that the pyramids are just giant resonators, energy generating devices, and, uh, and this is just...